What's up, human beings on the intertube? What's up, all you goat people and or human beings of the internet? This is episode 13 of Studio Practice, your no bullshit resource for those things that animate the artist and designer studio. Over the course of the last five episodes, there's been a lot of lip flapping and jibber jabbing on my part. <laughs> and very little evidence of ideas made manifest in material, which, as you may remember, is a major criteria for the success or failure of a work, in my mind. So in this episode, what we're gonna do is take a look at the manufacture of one very specific limited edition object of mine, and we're gonna use that as a platform to discuss how theory relates to making. I'll be machining this object out of a piece of Aspen that measures approximately seven by four by two and a half. I use double stick carpet tape to adhere the billet to the machining table. Here we see a three-dimensional model of the finished object. The dark blue lines superimposed over the object are the roughing tool path, which will be done with a quarter inch ball end mill. The roughing tool path removes large amounts of material very quickly, but does leave a four one hundredths of an inch thin skin of material for the final tool pass. This is the object immediately prior to running the finishing tool path. I set the zero point with a piece of paper. Just missed all the fun. Uh, I just buried this tapered end mill into the stock, which you see here. Uh, the first pass was far too aggressive, and now I've got to extract the bit from the material and start over. Here I am generating the finished tool path, which will be run with a 64th inch tapered ball end mill at an 8% step over. You can see here that there is a ridiculous level of detail to a tool path like this. This is what's referred to as a tapered end mill. The conical shape allows for increased strength and detail at the tip. I got the end mill out of the previous piece of stock. In many instances, the use of a tapered end mill allows you to omit the roughing tool path. I, however, was far too aggressive with my initial tool path, and I've got to take a step back and actually use a roughing tool path, then the tapered end mill. To keep that dust down, keep my lungs safe, and keep it out of my eyes, I use this, which is a Nest security cam, to monitor the CNC room, which is literally 25 feet away in the other room. Okay, here we begin the 3D finishing tool path, which is scheduled to take nine hours and 45 minutes. This is where the tapered end mill is removing four one hundredths of an inch to reveal the tremendous amount of detail in the original three-dimensional model. Nine hours and 45 minutes later, we use the shop vac to remove the dust and remove the item from the CNC table. So after 13 hours and 51 seconds of CNC time, here we see the finished object prior to painting. The beautiful grain structure of the wood in some ways makes it difficult to apprehend the actual object, so I've decided to paint the piece. I'm using a latex paint cut with water in order to allow the wood object to breathe so that the finished object still feels extremely organic and open. Here's the piece after the initial base coat. The final coat is with a technical gold paint and here at long last is the finished object, produced in an edition of 10, signed and numbered 4.25 inches by 7 by 1.54 inches, machined from a seamless Aspen panel, painted. The object is available through minislimited.com for $650. On the publishing date of this video, five out of the 10 editions still remain available for purchase. All right. Let's take a look at my suggestion for building an effective relationship between critical theory, language, and the actual non-abstract process of making work. And here is my suggestion for episode 13 to help you take your work to the next level. Point number one, theory and making reside in parallel tracks. Resist the overwhelming urge to drive theoretical issues directly through the work. There really are two different types of designers and artists. On one hand, you have those who have a deep and abiding distrust of language and critical theory, and who believe that there is the thing, and that there is the name for the thing, and that's one too many things. On the other hand, you have those who are largely academic, who believe in critical theory as a lens through which we come to a deeper understanding of the work, but in most instances, that becomes polluted in the process of making, whereby the designer or artist attempts to push 
critical theory didactically as a through line through the work. Here is my major suggestion for this episode. Riff, reading is fundamental. Critical theory is a primary tool through which we can come to a deeper understanding of our own process, culture as a whole, and contemporary art and design. However, it's my suggestion that you think of theory and work as parallel tracks. What am I saying? I'm suggesting that you read deeply, but in the process of making, you give no consideration to theoretical concerns. Rather, you rely on your history, on a lifetime of developing a deeper understanding of culture, aesthetics, technique, and practice. And you have faith in the simple fact that all of those things that you've read will come to bear in the moment of making. This object that we've been looking at today was conceived and executed in a 24 hour period on purpose, specifically to cultivate the type of characteristics that we have been discussing. Point number two, leverage speed and deadlines to force reactive work. So here is a suggestion for one technique to help you with the difficult task of separating theoretical issues from the process of making. Through cultivating both speed and deadlines, designers and artists are able to force themselves into a reactive mode whereby they silence the critical voice of judgment and they rely on history and experience in the moment to make aesthetic, structural, strategic, and conceptual choices that enable them to avoid driving theoretical issues as a through line didactically through the work. Point number four, establish a network of enterprises. What's a network of enterprises? A network of enterprises is establishing a whole host of different projects with different goals, different aims, and importantly, different deadlines and different levels of complexity that you're working on simultaneously. Point number five, Allow exploration of technique to drive a component of your However, work. However, be careful to make certain the work is not about technique, but rather about ideas. episode, I may have mentioned that while I have respect for the business model of the designer Paul Rand, I loathe his work. In the comments section, Courtney Stubber questioned my loathing for the designer Paul Rand and stated that he had never quite heard anyone characterize Paul's work that way. I'm going to save my response for the subject matter of a future episode, but suffice it to say that a number of years ago I wrote an essay entitled The Pygmy Raised by Giants that addresses the issue more directly. I'll tell you what, I really appreciate the comments and suggestions for future episodes. If you enjoyed the show, please share the link. It really helps. Till next time.